Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Welcome back, everybody. It's been uh, it's been an interesting year, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody over the next couple of days. A few things um, that we want to start with. Firstly, I want to start with a land acknowledgement, and um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands that we live and gather on today. AxSafe's offices stand on the stolen lands of the Tsleil-Waututh and Stolo peoples. We encourage you to recognize the Indigenous lands that currently care for you and find ways to respectfully engage with the caretakers of that land. Please feel free to share your land acknowledgements throughout the conference. We'd love to hear where you're from um, and who you're engaging with uh, in your community. Um, so, uh, a couple of bits of business we'll, we'll get through. Um, this is uh, year six for us with the conference, and we're delighted to have you all here. Uh, as you know, we had to go to the virtual platform again because uh, of COVID restrictions at the time. Uh, as you know, uh, fate, as fate would have it, we could now do it all live. But this is where we're at, and we're so thankful you all decided to join us. Um, <clears throat> a few other things I want to touch on before we get into our first and, and very notable uh, presenter uh, today. Um, uh, 2021 into 2022 has been another challenging year, as most of you know. Um, and all of us have been through um, the ringer on multiple levels. And our entire industry uh, has really, on the performing arts side and motion picture as well, has, has really um, had a tough go of it. So uh, I'm really glad everybody's here and we have a chance to kind of visit, um, maybe reconnect, start to spread the word and support each other through the next little while as we reopen or return to whatever it is we're returning to. Um, so I want to take the time to recognize a few things. Um, the challenges here at Axe, we have not been immune to this. We've had uh, we've had our challenges and the team has done amazingly well. Um, as you know, Manu Nalula has moved on to uh, greener pastures, as it were, and we're very thankful we had him for the three years and he left us in a fabulous position to continue doing the work that we're doing. So I wanted to make sure we recognize uh, Manu's con contribution to all of this. The other uh, thing that happened this last year that um, still hard to talk about is we lost Mo. Uh, so Mo Cake was a big part of our team. And, uh, and one of my rocks during uh, a lot of the stuff that we've gone through over the years. And you will see in the corner here that I'm running uh, an image of Mo. Um, so she will be with us over the entire conference. And also to remember, Mo is always watching. Um, so we miss you, Mo. And uh, she would be here right now, probably loading comments into that chat. That would make me blush. And I miss her, um, I miss her every day. So thank you all for joining us. I'm doing this for Mo. Um, and some other friends that we lost this year. Uh, and I'm really glad we have everybody here uh, to support us, the team, and each other. Uh, throughout, the, for, uh, throughout the next couple of days, I really want everybody to try to connect with some new people. Uh, if you see me on the floor, please flag me down. We'd love to have a chat. We'll also would love to meet everybody here as well as the rest of the AxeSafe team. Um, a few other things just before we go, I've got one minute left. Uh, make sure uh, you try out the CC feature. Um, uh, also, make sure you join us at uh, 345 for bingo, because the prizes are redonkulous this year. Um, a huge thank you to JST for helping with everything. Uh, a reminder that the sessions will be recorded, because we want to be able to replay these for people who couldn't see all the sessions, because as usual, the team has put together such great programming. You want to see it all, but you can't. Um, uh, and as Aiden mentioned, we also want to remind you that this is a respectful and safe space. Uh, we encourage you to share, allow others to share, and make space for all ideas. Use respectful language and support your fellow delegates. If at any point uh, you see any inappropriate behavior or language, please let the act safe know, and we will uh, we will act on that as soon as we possibly can. Um, I also want to thank uh, um, all of our sponsors really quickly. UBCP ACTRA, Teamsters, IATSE 891, IATSE International, Teamsters Canada, <laughs> Directors Guild of Canada, IATSE 118, 168, ICG, International Cinema, Cinematographers Guild, CMPA, and ADC 659. Um, and for our social event this evening, BIS Safety Software, uh, Stretch Breaks, which is Stage Fab, huge friends of ours, um, and uh, so many acronyms. I know, Trina, it's, it's painful. And of course, our longtime partners at CITT ICTS, which is the Canadian Institute for Theatre Technologies, and most importantly, our partners who have been with us for since the inception of the organization, WorkSafe BC. 
And please make sure that you reach out and talk to the WorkSafe BC members that are here, Trina Pollard, Kim Stubbs, uh, Paul Berg, and I know they're all, all here or will be here. Um, they are uh, huge partners for us and we really want to make sure that you welcome them and get to know them because they're a great resource going down the road. And I went one minute over. So now I get to introduce one of the most amazing people in our industry, uh, Mr. Eric Stewart. Eric and I have known each other now for six years, I guess. And Eric is uh, the president of the UKCMA, uh, which is the uh, sorry, United Kingdom Crowd Management Association. And he's also the chair of the newly formed Global Crowd Management Alliance. That is to say, this guy works with everybody and is changing the face of crowd management around the globe. Uh, I consider him a friend. He has been a partner with AXA for many years now. Miss him dearly because we had, this was supposed to be in person, Eric, and we were not quite there yet. Um, also can tell you that he will be in the Lower Mainland May 2nd and 3rd to do a course. So if you're interested, hit us up and we'll get you a, a link to the sign up for that. Um, and all that to be said, uh, Eric, we miss you a great deal here on the West Coast of Canada. And welcome back to the conference. Thank you for joining us. Miss you too, my brother. It's uh, It's been too long. I, I was just saying before this chat, my, my last real-life conference before the Wednesday just gone two days ago was actually at AxSafe in Vancouver when we tried to scramble to return back to the UK as things started to deteriorate around the world. Um, really miss you guys. Just talking about that conference on Wednesday, I followed a lady who lost her son in the Manchester bombing and had to walk on stage immediately after listening to her speak for half an hour. Um, and now I have to follow you on stage after that lovely tribute to Mo, and, and we miss her desperately as well. So, Mo, this is for you. Thanks very much, Don. Okay, I'm really hoping, I, I love this tech and this IT, but I just I just really want to get back in a room. And on, on Wednesday, I managed to get back in a room uh, and presented to 100 people on a similar topic to this, not exactly the same, but but fairly similar so I'm just hoping, at least I knew then that they could see me and they could hear me. And I sit behind the screen here, really wanting to be out with you in Vancouver and just hoping that everything's working. But I know that Aidan would be shouting in my ear by now if it wasn't. So I'm going to go with it on an assumption that it is. I'm going to speak for probably just over an hour, maybe 70 minutes or so. And when I first talked about this subject, we used to call it the changing nature of crowd behaviors in a a post-pandemic world and it wasn't long into the first presentation that I suddenly realized that I didn't think we were going to be talking about a post-pandemic world for quite some time. I think we're going to be talking about a peri-pandemic world for a little time to come yet. For those that know me and or don't know me and haven't met me yet uh, and I do hope we'll be able to see some of you in May when we come over to do the crowd safety conference. My name is Eric Stewart. I'm a, a crowd safety manager by trade my history is as a police officer in London, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. I spent 33 years in the police force, was really proud of what I did and what we did. And we worked in large scale events, planning things like the Notting Hill Carnival, which is a, a big West Indian Jamaican carnival, around about a million people over a couple of days. And the New Year's Eve celebrations in London, which can be 10,000 or so people watching the fireworks on the embankment. And then I finished my last job for the, in the police was planning the Olympic torch relay. And part of that trip, uh, part of that learning before that was to actually come out to Vancouver in 2010 and spend some time on the road with the uh, teams, the presenting teams for the torch relay and with the sponsors and with the RCMP as well. Brilliant experience. And, and that was my first trip to Vancouver. I'm delighted to say it hasn't been my last. After I left the police, now here's a crazy thing. After I left the police, I decided to go and learn how to manage crowds because inside policing, you don't get crowd management training, you get crowd control training. And I pretty soon realized that that was missing from my itinerary of the work I wanted to do in events. So I went off and I did a foundation degree and then a BA honors degree in crowd safety management. And part of that third year particularly was looking at psychology and behavior of crowds. That has led me to set up this company, Gentian Events, and become the chair of these two organizations, the UK Crowd Management Association and the newly launched Global Crowd Management Alliance that we only launched back in December. We've already got, I think, 160 members and we've got a footprint in 18 countries already. So that is going from strength to strength really quickly. 
But my core job is as a crowd safety manager, and I've told Don this many a time, but he keeps ignoring me. I hate teaching. That's not what I set out to do. But if I can stand in a field and keep 60, 70,000 people safe, then it seems that people want to listen to me talking about how to do that so they can all go and stand in fields and maybe keep a couple of million safe between them. So whilst people keep asking me to do that, I'm going to carry on doing it. I was really fortunate at the end of my police career to, to meet Her Majesty the Queen and be awarded with the Queen's Policing Medal, which sits very proudly in my office and will stay there uh, and will probably be worn again on the final day. My last big event in relation to the Queen is already planning, sadly planning her funeral procession and parade. And I've spent nearly all day today on calls, just making sure. And despite anything you might have read in an American newspaper this week, she's fine. She's fine. She wasn't on the call, but the people that were on the call had been with her this morning, and we're all assured that she's okay. One thing I should say before I start properly is we, you, Canada, and the US, I know there's people from both, we are kind of disconnected sometimes by the language that we use. And I have put my foot in it, which is an English expression that may or may not translate occasionally when I've been to the other side of the Atlantic and said things that some people have taken offense at. I never, ever say anything with intent to offend anybody. But what you might call a truck, we will call a lorry. And I think those simple things translate. Your trunk or the American trunk is my boot. And if anybody brought gas anywhere near my car, I would be running a mile because that's something highly explosive that I wouldn't have anywhere near me, never mind a car. So please, if I say anything that sounds like I'm upsetting anybody or misusing it, please accept that's not the the intention especially and this was the case and the the last session a couple of years ago i used one of these phrases in a context which is perfectly normal and usable and is the normal language used by those communities in the uk to themselves i used it in a different context out in canada and someone got a little bit upset please i beg you to just consider i am absolutely not intending to upset anybody if i'm going to do anything i might scare you and I may well scare you later on in the in the session, and I warn you now in advance, I'm going to show a couple of video clips, which I will give you warning that are coming, that are not pleasant. You're not going to see anybody die, but you are going to see some people get hurt in a set of circumstances which make my skin crawl because of their, A, lack of necessity, and B, the reasons why they came about and the unnecessary reasons why they came about. So I will warn you when they're coming up, so please look away from the screen we've turned the audio off on those so you're not you're not hearing the audio either i will stop talking or talk over the video and describe the video at times and when i stop talking to say the video is finished please turn back to the screen if you wish so what do i do i plan the crowds around major events i don't plan events that's not my job other people plan the events i plan to try to keep the crowd safe and just having a quick look at those from i want to do top to bottom certainly but durham lumiere is a half a million attended event where we we light up a city uh, and if you come down right through christmas markets near the bottom there Vansu, uh, Vasu, Vasaki in vancouver that was a job we came over five years ago i think now and looked at the crowd management around that between six and eight hundred thousand people and i guess the important thing for me there was to point out to people that because it's a religious event doesn't make it automatically safe. More people die at religious events every year than virtually any other type of event. There are more crowd crushers, not through any intent, not through any malice or ill will, just too many people in one space at one time, highly motivated to do something. And that, that motivation in their case is religion, and it leads to people getting crushed. And we cover that off quite well on the crowd safety course for those that have done it or those that are going to come and do it. We'll try and explain why that motivation is so important in understanding our crowds. Recent events this year, in the last year or so, at least, uh, at least everything from Durham Lumiere again, back discussing Versace, Edinburgh Hogmanay, which is, um, for those that don't know, that's Hogmanay is the way the Scots in Scotland celebrate their New Year's Eve. And they may be a little bit in that as well but even during lockdown we managed to continue to do some planning around events and work with some of the companies that we've worked with before and we're now back working with 
sitting in pride of place two thirds of the way down the list. Sorry, Don, I'll promote you on that. Is out in Vancouver. Some of you may, if, if anybody follows soccer in the UK, one of the things that's gone horribly wrong and relating to what I'm talking about today is the Wembley Euro 2020 finals, which actually took place in July of 2021 because of COVID, everything was delayed. And we had been predicting for an awful long time that when events came back and when people started mixing and going out, there may be some behaviours that we weren't quite sure yet what they would look like. And I'm going to try and go through now why we think those behaviours have changed. What are the triggers for those changes? I'll give you some examples of those changes, certainly over here, although you've had some examples yourself. And then what we can do about it. If we're trying to look after people and look after crowds that are going to come to events, how can we keep them safer? So acknowledging our colleagues and friends that kept us surviving during uh, COVID, it was a business we effectively shut down. The one big piece of work that we get did get during COVID was to build, plan, or plan, build, and then operate, unfortunately, a temporary mortuary for over 800 people on one of our military bases. But people on this screen and on the previous kept us going with some tick over work in the background. So we actually managed to survive COVID in a way that sadly many others in terms of businesses didn't survive. And there's a lot of people, a lot of friends from the business who no longer are working in this business. And that in itself is relevant as well to all of us because we have lost practice, we have lost experience, but so have our crowds. Our crowds have been away from events for two years in some places. Less so if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia and New Zealand got away relatively lightly in the first round of COVID and even the second, but now they're suffering in a way that we suffered 18 months ago. So it's bear worth bearing in mind that different experiences have been different around the world. Literally, no two journeys have been the same. There is a, a phrase, uh, a very old phrase, no man crosses the same river twice. And it's true because it's not the same river and he's not the same man. We should modernize that, but a couple of thousand years old. You think about that, no river that you ever cross is going to be the same as it was, even if you crossed it 20 minutes beforehand. The water may have risen or dropped. The path might be slightly different. But your experience of crossing the river the first time makes you better equipped to cross it the second time. And those are the differences that we have to look at now in the way that we have all lived differently through COVID because there's currently 130 plus people on this call. If I sat every single one of you down and said, tell me your experience of COVID, I will have a 130 different sheets of paper. If I go to the UK and ask 70 million people, for their experiences of COVID, COVID, I would have 70 million different experiences. Some similarities, but some very, very different. Your nationality and where you lived at the time would have made a difference to A, when COVID hit your country, and B, what happened when it did. Certainly where you lived inside that country could make a difference as well. The way some of our counties, your states and areas responded, at different speeds with different actions and if you look at the us particularly the way state to state to state the response was treated differently means that the people living in those states had different experiences of it your age older people and vulnerable people from the outset we knew were going to be more vulnerable than younger people it was only a matter of weeks into this thing that we pretty much worked out where the most vulnerable people were going to be in terms of those who were most likely or more likely to die than others. So your age at the time when this thing came would have made a huge difference to you. Your sex, there were very, very strong indicators at the first that, um, that females were suffering more than men. And then it kind of switched around and then balanced back out again. But if your perception going through this is that you are more likely to suffer than the other sex or someone younger, older than you, then your perception of this disease is going to be different from a person sitting next to you who may be of the opposite sex who thinks, well, I'm a little bit safer than she is or she's a little bit safer than I am. Your ethnicity. One of the reasons we had to race really quickly, activated by a local authority, one of our city authorities to build a mortuary, is because the area where they were covering 
covers two of our largest Asian communities in the UK. So when I say Asian, I'm talking about Indian and Pakistan. The areas around Luton and Bedfordshire where we were working have the some of the highest proportions of Pakistani and Indian born people in the UK. And they were far, far more vulnerable for a whole host of different reasons. Some of them physically, some of them physiologically, some of them practically because the way that they lived. Many of our uh, Asian and Indian families still live in overcrowded, multi-occupancy, multi-generational households where the younger generations are still having to go out at work. And they did go out to work because they are, a huge number of them are working in our food supply industry. They work in our delivery industry. So they were essential workers and they had to keep going out to work. But because they live with their parents, grandparents, and sometimes great grandparents within the same small communities, same small houses, they were going out and picking up infections that weren't making them ill, but they were taking them back and literally killing grandma. So your ethnicity in the UK was, in, well, around the world, was incredibly um, indicative as to how you were going to come through COVID, or maybe you, you would, but your family wouldn't. Oops, excuse me. And the government approach, depending on what country you're in, and in, over in the UK, county to county, town to town, city to city, they picked up and interpreted central government legislation differently and enforced it differently. So at times during COVID, one county here in the UK was quite happy to hold a music concert of 30,000 people when we'd unlocked a little bit, but the county next door wouldn't even open a campsite of about 250. So that difference, depending on where you lived and where you were able to travel to, would make a huge difference as well. But there were other differences as well. Did your country, did your state, did your county, did your town insist on lockdowns? Some countries never went to lockdown in those first few months or even within the first year. New Zealand did a lockdown, but they effectively locked down their country. They just stopped people coming in and out. And those that had to come in and out had to go into isolation and be tested so as not to spread the disease. There are still islands around the Pacific where COVID hasn't yet affected them. And now they live in fear that at some stage they have to reopen and let people back in without huge conditions. And if they do, suddenly then it will arrive. And much like we saw in the 15th, 16th, 17th century when people started traveling to other countries, they will receive the diseases that so far that they've avoided as we infected so many countries when we traveled around the world. Was yours one of those countries that believed was what your uh, state system thinking, as we did in the UK in the first few weeks, that actually the only way out of this was for everybody to get it? And in some ways, that's true. The best form of immunity is given to those people that have survived it. But is the cost of that worthwhile? Do we really want to lose 75% or whatever it is of the population over the age of 70 so that everybody can get back on with a normal life? Now, I'm not saying, and I will never say, which is right and which is wrong and which view is the right view. What I'm saying is we need to listen to everybody's view and we can argue and we can discuss, but we need to understand that people have different opinions. But during this, of course, during COVID, opinions became very, very diametrically opposed. There seemed to be no centre ground. You either believed in herd immunity or you didn't. No middle ground. You either believe in vaccinations or you don't. No middle ground. There are no people sitting on the fence anymore. Everybody's got to dive one side of the fence or the other. That's not quite true, but that's the way it started to feel. Did you have PPE? Did you have personal protective equipment? I'm pretty convinced that most of my government didn't even know what those initials stood for because for the first three months of their broadcasts, they were talking about PPE equipment. So personal protective equipment equipment was what they were looking for. No wonder they couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. I was operating a mortuary. We weren't told which of the bodies we received were those infected and that had died of COVID or those that had died for other reasons. Without being too graphic, and apologies if this upsets anybody, 
but the team I was operating didn't even have body bags. Some of those bodies were delivered to us wrapped in sheets from their home address because we needed urgent storage, but we had no protection. We were walking around with scarves wrapped around our faces and gloves and normal gloves that we wear in the winter, although this was spring and actually quite hot, and then taking them home each night and washing them because that's all we could get hold of. And actually, you know, we felt guilty if we did get delivered any PPE because we knew our hospitals, our doctors, our nurses, and nursing home and old people's home staff probably needed it more than we did. We rejected two lots of PPE when we had a low level of stock because we knew the hospitals were screaming out for it. I wish I could say that was the same for everybody, but we know that's not the case. Did you have vaccines available? Canada, you were way behind the UK in terms of vaccines. And that's something I feel really guilty about because I've got friends in Canada who were working in similar environments, similar dangerous environments, and months and months and months we were vaccinated and in some cases second vaccinated. My brother, my family, my friends in Canada still hadn't received their first vaccine. Not much I can do about that. I can't really package them up and start sending them abroad, but it did make me feel pretty sick and pretty guilty and worried about their safety, knowing how quickly this thing was spreading around the world. But let's be honest, if I'm guilty about what happened in Canada, we should all be guilty about what's going on in some of the third world countries that are still yet to receive any level of vaccines. Does it keep me awake at night? No, because there's nothing I can do about it. But it really does upset me that it's still going on and we still haven't managed to find a level where we can help to supply others. Because the affordability of the vaccines was one of the big questions. We got in early, we got in relatively cheap. I think it's fair to say that our opposition and a lot of our government ministers thought we had overpaid a ridiculous price for something that was probably not really going to be necessary. The proof of the pudding was in the eating and it was quite a different story in the outcome. We unlocked and got back to a level of normality quicker than most countries did. And as of yesterday, there are no legal restrictions in the UK. I don't have to wear a mask anywhere. I can test for COVID if I want, but I don't have to. And if I do test for COVID tomorrow morning and find that I've got it, I can still go to work. Now, you may think that's crazy. I think that's crazy. But if I test for COVID tomorrow morning, I'm still permitted to go to work. Unless the employer puts in a policy that says, don't come to work if you've tested positive with COVID, stay at home and we'll pay you wages for working from home. But as far as the law is concerned, all those restrictions are off. Do I feel comfortable with that? Hmm. Wednesday, I stood in a room and presented to about 90 to 100 people, a very large room, very well spaced out, four or five people to a table. It felt okay. At lunchtime, that room, along with three other rooms, all came together in one room that was only twice as big, and suddenly there was 450 people in a room. I opened the door, stood, looked, felt quite ill. I actually think I probably went pale and turned around and decided that the McDonald's quarter of a mile down the road was a better option than stepping into that room to get my free lunch, and that's exactly what I did. It did not feel right or comfortable to me yet to be walking into that room. And the application of vaccines was important and different wherever you went, age and vulnerability, jobs. We argued for a long time in this country as to whether or not we should be prioritising nurses and doctors and people working in old people's homes. And then we decided that that was the right thing to do. And then we decided that if they didn't have the vaccinations, they would no longer be able to work in those jobs. And it's only just a couple of months ago that they withdrew, in fact, last month that they withdrew the restriction that said, if you haven't had a vaccine and booster, you can no longer work in an old people's home. You will be sacked. You will be laid off. And thousands were laid off because they didn't have the vaccine, so they couldn't continue to do that work. And we've only just lifted that restriction, but there's still an awful lot of people that have left that really difficult job and have not yet gone back and possibly won't go back because of the way that they were treated. So we had this pressure on wealthy nations to share vaccines and that that divided us again as, as countries, as people within countries, there was no gray space in the middle of that line. You either believed that we should share vaccines or you said, no, 
we look after ourselves. We have got to look after our own people first. And there was no discussion that you could have on TV or radio or even in the street with someone who said, well, do you know what? I see both sides. I get both sides. And maybe we could do a bit. That, that group of people that saw both sides were tiny and were shrinking. Over here, we focused on the elderly and the vulnerable. And that is something I absolutely do not regret. But we then told young people to stay indoors and not go out. No parties, no life, no enjoyment, no fun. Don't see your mates. Don't even see your girlfriend. If you live in a house with your parents and your girlfriend is three streets away or three houses away with her parents, you're not allowed to see her. So the elderly and the vulnerable are getting these jabs. The young people are getting nothing but told that their life is now on hold. Now, the counter argument some people will give, and, and I will try to explain what I mean by this, is that older people, me, have lost a bigger proportion of their lives. If you're 18 years old when this started, and let's say, for instance, it was a two-year pandemic which we're just coming out of, if you were 18 years old when this occurred, you've now lost 3% of your likely remaining years. And that's based on the rough assumption that people these days are living in the Western world to, to around about 80. But if you were 60 years old, which I had already passed when this started, and I'm going to live to 80, I've lost 10% of my remaining years. So I can say quite understandably maybe that an 18-year-old has only lost a little bit of their remaining life, whereas I've lost a huge part of mine. And the reality is that we both lost two years. Neither has suffered more or suffered less in that regard, in terms of percentages. And using those figures, as some of the media have over here, doesn't help. It drives between the 18 and the 60-year-old, the young and the old, to say, you had it worse than the other one. But the reality is, in effect, we've both lost two years. But the real, real reality, the actual reality, is none of us have lost two years. We just had two years totally different to what we expected. Two years to do some stuff that we might not have got the chance to do. I mean, how many people on this call, now up to 140, managed to get the decorating done or the house rebuild or refit that they'd been planning to do for years but really didn't have the time or the opportunity? How many people managed to sit down and read those books that they've promised themselves they'd read for years? How many people managed to sit every single week at seven eight nine o'clock of an evening every wednesday speaking with colleagues and friends around the world in six different countries and build a global crowd management alliance that would never ever have been possible without covid because nobody on those calls over 20 people nobody on those calls could possibly have afforded to spend two hours every week on a wednesday night or for my new zealand and australian friends wednesday morning at 5 a.m. getting on that call. It simply couldn't have happened. I haven't lost two years. I've just had two different years from the one that I expected. But did life change? Oh, absolutely. Of course it's changed. It's changed for everybody and in many, many different ways. It's changed not just for everyone, but forever. It really has changed. Our lives will not go back to what they were before because the river we're used to crossing has changed and we are changed people as a result of COVID. But how do we live with those changes? How do we live with what, for want of a better phrase, the new normal? How do we come to terms with what comes next? Some strange things happened. Um, I was really lucky. I was classed as a key worker and I got a letter from the city authorities saying that I could leave my house and drive when nobody else could. If people had known where I was driving to and the work that I was doing, they probably wouldn't have swapped their life for my letter. But still, it's true. I managed to drive down the motorway, down the highway, to a site which is normally about two hours from me. On a bad day, that would be three hours. For those that have visited the UK, it's a motorway called the M1. Uh, and second worst only to the M25, which circles London. But a normal two hour or on a bad day, two and a half to three hours drive was taking me about 55 minutes. I probably couldn't have done that and built that during normal traffic operations. I certainly couldn't have traveled there and back every day. I would have had to stay over somewhere. Oh, except all the hotels were closed. So I'd have been sleeping in the back of my car or 
in one of those tents covering the refrigerators, which is not somewhere I wanted particularly to spend the night. So my journeys took half as long, but some people who sneaked out and broke the rules who I got very grumpy at, they really took advantage. I've never seen cars driving down that motorway at the speed I saw that day. They knew the police were busy doing other things. They knew nobody was really watching them. And speeds of 120, 130, 140 mile an hour that you might see on a German autobahn legally were appearing on the roads next to me. I was doing my normal 70 mile an hour and I was being overtaken and made to look like I stood still. So fast, sometimes you couldn't even see the registration mark of the car that came past you. But there were some great things. There was no contrails in the sky. I didn't see a contrail off an aeroplane for years. Um, the phrase I've used there, that's really bad use of the English language. I don't think there is a word called bluer. I'm not quite sure. But the skies were blue. It was green. It sounds like the start of a song. So it cheers me up every time I see it. And they were. The skies were bluer and the grass did seem greener. And I was driving past deer. That's not something we see very often off the motorway in the UK. We had wildlife all over the place. Sadly, when the cars came back, we saw that wildlife, but it was laying by the side of the road, having been hit by a truck. But they did. They took back those grass verges where they wouldn't normally venture. And they, they made my journey to work a pleasure. I could see things that I wouldn't normally see. And I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. Somebody beat me to it in a way. Be kinder to people. Don't get meaner. People were kinder. People were kinder for the first few months of this. We went through something together and we built a group, a society that was nicer and kinder. Here in the UK, we, we really began to appreciate properly for the first time, perhaps, our national health service, our doctors, our nurses, our hospitals, our ambulance drivers. And every Wednesday night, we came out and we started clapping. So at six o'clock, everybody came out on the street, every street, every neighborhood, you spoke and saw neighbors that you had never, ever seen before. And everybody was applauding. And then people started to bring in our air horns and pans with wooden spoons. And we were banging drums for them. It, it was an amazing time to be alive. Didn't last, but it was an amazing time to be alive. Even some of our politicians started to agree with each other. That lasted less time than us banging pans. But just for a few weeks, there was some agreement amongst the politicians. And I have to say, I was pretty scared. You know, I am in that older demographic. I'm in the heavier demographic. And I've had some previous problems with my lungs. I've got some scar tissue. So I was falling into the category where if I caught this first wave, certainly my survivability chances weren't great. Now, I've got grandchildren who are now two and a half years old, but at the time were six months. And I was terrified of not seeing them grow up. And I'm just, I, I do keep glancing down to the chat because it's important. It's amazing how many phases of this thing we've gone through and how far away those early pandemic days seem now. Holly, thank you. Yes, it seems like a lifetime ago. And it was two years, slightly less than two years. But at that time, in March and April and May and maybe June, we were actually really scared of this thing. We were scared not just for ourselves. Importantly, and more importantly, we were scared for each other and we were scared for our families and friends. And those of you that ever hear me talk about crowd psychology and emergency behaviors, when we're in an emergency, if I'm on my own, it's not too bad. I know all I have to do is to look after me. But you see me in an emergency with my wife or my daughters or my grandchildren, and I'm a different beast because I'm going to fight harder to keep them alive than I would even fight to keep myself alive. And I was scared for me. And I was scared for my children and my wife and my grandchildren. At six months old, we had no idea what was going to happen to young children if they caught it back two years ago. The selfish view says this, I've lost 10% of my remaining life, but I've already told you that's not strictly true. My elder brother's wedding, his wife unfortunately died not from COVID, pre-COVID, but he was remarrying due to remarry shortly after I came back from ACTSAFE two years ago. And his wedding was cancelled three times. And then they decided, they are late in life as well. My brother's seven years older than me. He decided, and she decided that they needed to get married. And they just have to do it without anybody there. So none of the family were able to attend their wedding. And all their photographs are then wearing masks. They've got one picture outside, side by side, not wearing masks. But all the pictures inside of the church are all them wearing masks. 
for virtually a year, I didn't see my daughters. Now, that was selfish on my part because I was going to work in a mortuary where people had COVID. And again, in those first years, those first months, we had no idea what transmission from dead bodies was. But we were moving these bodies. So there was exhalation of air, air during the movement. And we had no idea whether COVID could be carried on that breath. I didn't want to see my daughters because I didn't want to infect them. But neither did they want to see me because they know I fall into that vulnerable category. So they didn't want to see me and infect me. Can you imagine how you would feel if you were the person that gave a close relative COVID and they then died? And there may be people on this call that have been in that position. And if you are, I am so sorry. Fault. No matter what happened, we had to get on with our lives. But people caught COVID actually suffered very lightly, but passed it on to relatives who died. And that is in every country, everywhere in the world. I missed a year of my twin daughters growing up. I got to see them on Skype or Zoom or Teams or something every day, but not in real life. Has that affected my relationship with them going forward? Will they remember those times when we go forward? I don't know. These are still unknowns for all of us. I have no idea whether or not they're going to remember these times. 100% of my company, which we built up over nearly 12 years, ceased to function. We had no work until a couple of months later, the mortuary came in. But all of my normal income, my training, my events, my festival work, my crowd management, reviews of other people's plans, everything stopped. It came back and it's come back with a vengeance now, but it did come back slowly. But I could say from a selfish point of view, I spent 10, 12 years building a company that was annihilated in the space of a few weeks and could easily have been closed down but on the other hand no one in my close family died no one even got seriously ill it's only since omicron's come that we've actually had infection in one of my son-in-laws and one of my daughters they got a cold they're fine i lost nobody in that period i've got a pension from my policing so i've still got some money to live on i own my house i don't have a mortgage both of my daughters continued to get paid because they were such that they needed to be at work, even though sometimes they were working from home. But they both got paid, so there was no pressure financially on them, no pressure financially on me. I wish I could say the same for hundreds of my friends in the events industry and probably people on this call as well. They were difficult times for an awful lot of people, people wondering what they could afford in terms of whether it's food or heating or lighting or power, certainly none of the luxuries. Others got paid and had nothing to spend it on. And actually, there's more money sloshing around in people's bank accounts around the world for most parts of the world now than there's ever been because they've had nothing to spend it on for years apart from decorating and building work, except you couldn't then get the builders or the decorators. We all had different experiences. And I got that new work and about 50% of my income is back. And now I would say we're back. We're probably at about 110% or 20% even than where we were before in terms of work. It helps when people pay, but at least we're getting the work for now. I can't complain. I just can't complain about COVID and the way it affected me and my life. Yet, I still do. I, I wake up some mornings and think, it's not fair. I got locked away for such a long period of time and there were things that I wanted to do and I couldn't do them. I get angry with some of the religious communities. Some of you know that have heard me speak before. I spent three years of my operational uh, policing as the community liaison sergeant with the Orthodox Jewish community, the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jews in North London. And I'm still in touch with them, and I speak to them on a regular basis. And I have my own rabbi who helped me through understanding that community. And I phoned that rabbi one day to say, I've just seen you on the news saying that it's God's will whether people die or not, and you're going to carry on doing weddings, and you're going to carry on doing funerals and large community meetings. What, what are you thinking of? Please don't do that. Don't kill my friends by doing that. But I got an answer phone message saying um, that the person who I rang wasn't available, so I didn't get to say any of those things. And the next day, I got a phone call back from his number from another rabbi to say, unfortunately, he died from COVID two days previously. He'd recorded a sermon to be given out at the synagogue because he didn't feel very well telling people to carry on their lives as normal and then had died the next day. Did I get angry or was I more upset? I'm still not quite sure. I'm, I'm really not.
but he was a good friend. He taught me everything I needed to know and more about the Jewish community, and we stayed in touch ever since. And I'm angry about what he said, and I'm devastated that he died from COVID. Unlawful music events. We have raves in the UK like we've not seen since the 80s. When I was a young cop, two, three years service, every Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, I'd be going to a warehouse or a derelict building or sometimes a field, and we'd have raves with hundreds, maybe thousands of kids in there with no safety, drugs galore and alcohol being sold openly and no toilets, no bathrooms, generators that were running on petrol with people topping them up as they went while the engine was still running. And then in 2000 and 2001, it all came back, but on a level I've never seen before. Because if you don't understand what's going on in people's minds and you don't understand that people absolutely need to party and the younger they are, the more likely they're going to want to party, and you look lock up every legal opportunity for them to do that, they're just going to go and do it anyway. We needed to think twice about locking people down, and that generation, that age group particularly, was never, ever going to respond well to a government run by old, predominantly white men who never understand or even try to understand how our young people think. But they locked them up, threw away the key, I'm talking about the mindset of the younger people here. So they said, screw you, we're going to go and party. And they did. We tell students that they had to go to university, but sit in their rooms in their halls of residence and go to their lectures online. What's the point of that? Why not stay at home? At least there was no temptation to go and see the other 23 people in the rooms in your corridor. They were never going to stay in their rooms. They were always going to mix with those 23 other people. We've got to stop trying to tell people what to do when they know that we're not, we know they're not going to do it. We've got to stop hoping that people will comply with things that they never were going to. We've got to stop hoping for better people and make better plans for the real people that we've got. And then we were told that those students, even though we had quite large stocks at this point, they didn't need the vaccination because they were way at the bottom of the list. The 60s upwards first, then the 50s upwards, 40s upwards, 30s upwards. Then maybe we'll get round to some of the students, but not all of the students, depending on if you're a last year or first year student at university. Then, having told them they couldn't have the vaccines, then we told them they'd got to if they even wanted to go to a club or to a show. If I'm 18 or 19 and you tell me for a year I can't have a vaccine and then tell me I've got to have it or else, I'm just going to get pretty angry with you especially when I look at you and you are that bunch of old white men telling me what to do. Students are rebellious. Students are hardwired to push the boundaries. It's what young people do. It's how they grow up and how they make mistakes and how they get their life experiences. They were always going to push those boundaries to breaking point. And the lack of input by crowd psychologists and people that understood what would happen into our government, that lack of input, really was appalling for the first 12 months. It came later, and it's actually pretty well ensconced now, but it was awful. Illegal road racing. Wow. We reduced the number of accidents in the UK by about 95%, but proportionally speaking, the number of fatal accidents nearly trebled because the speeds that were on the road and the way people were driving just meant that people were going crazy and killing themselves or each other and others. And then protests. Wow. Wow. They got scary, and they got really scary really quickly. And some of the things that were taking place in the UK, yes, a lot of things came together. Yes, Black Lives Matter as a movement grew and expanded and exploded at the wrong time in terms of COVID. You know, you can see people there, a few masks. That is an illegal protest in Bristol. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But we've not seen that level of angry protest in the UK for as long as I can remember. Never during my policing did I see that sort of behavior being almost tolerated and accepted by policing but that would have been stopped hours and hours before it ever reached that level in the UK but that and lots of other things going on led to some remarkable situations that I wouldn't have expected to see the Bristol Colston statue you've just seen the picture of Colston was a slave trader uh, and of course when Black Lives Matter started to erupt 
and we had the the series. It wasn't just one shooting of a black man in America. It was a series. When that all started to expand, Colston and others became the targets. But they'd been targets for years in Bristol, not to the extent that we saw there. The attacks on the Capitol building. I've I've studied that video, you know, four hours at the Capitol building. If you've if you've seen it, and it's remarkable how many people there got there but then didn't know what to do i don't think they ever expected to reach as far as they did and it was on oh my word what happened here what am i supposed to do next they had no idea they were really angry but half the time they didn't know what they were angry about wembley i'm going to show you a couple of videos of them that's referring back to the 2020 euro finals england are in a final for the first time in 50 years of a major soccer tournament it's at home We've been locked down for 18 months. And there's some also some really strange stuff that we just didn't anticipate, couldn't have anticipated. Uber Eats has got a lot to answer for. Deliveroo has got a lot to answer for. You can now order booze to be delivered to you in the middle of a crossroads. If you run out of alcohol, you can phone, make the order, and pay for a local supermarket to have you. And we pretty soon found out that you could also do that with cocaine and with other amphetamines and particularly ketamine, which is what people at Wembley were living on that day, ketamine and cocaine, and sometimes speedballing those two things. The situation was bizarre. Now, I'm involved with others in trying to unpick what happened at Astro World, and I really want to emphasize this. I am not for one second blaming the people at Astro World who died at Astro World. We've made that mistake before. We called it Hillsborough. 96 people, now 97, because there's another one died just recently, although the incident was in 1989. 96 people died in a football stadium in the UK, and for weeks and months, the fans were blamed for what happened that day. And then in the months and years that followed, and the inquiries that followed, it pretty soon became apparent that it was massive failures on behalf of the authorities and bad planning by the authorities and police that led to those 96 people dying. So please do not go away from here. I'll say this again and again. I am not blaming anybody yet for what happened at Astro World. But you saw the same as me. You saw people storming through search detectors, metal detectors. And for those that don't know, there are stories that say that they were people who ran from the outside and crashed their way through the gates, and that's why there was extra people there, which was why there was crushing. That's incorrect. Those people, the vast majority at least, were already ticketed and had been checked. It was the search that they got impatient waiting for. They weren't additional people on top of the numbers that were planned for. There were some behaviours there that we have seen replicated around the world since summer last year, at music concerts, at football, at other sports, where people's behavior now seems to be off the scale in terms of their patience or lack of, their tolerance, their self-righteous attitude that I've been locked down for two years, therefore there is nobody who's going to tell me no. And this is multi-generational and it's multi-ethnic. This is not a group of young white thugs this is not predominantly men. Actually, football it is, but in most circumstances, it seems to be everybody. Those I describe as my English heritage crowd, the older, wealthy, entitled crowd that come to some of our classical music concerts, even they are now more expect expecting and have got a, a lower level of tolerance than they would have had prior to COVID. And I don't understand all the reasons. The psychologists don't understand all the reasons. But we're trying to, what we're trying to do at the moment is trying to work out what on earth to do about it. So there's Mr. Colston having been broken off his statue, painted, and just about to be dumped into a river. He was retrieved from the river and he's currently sitting, waiting for a decision as to whether they're going to clean the paint off and then put him in a museum as a, a tribute to what those people did in their fight against racism and slavery, or whether he just gets melted down and disappears. Um, I am of the view, and it's very much my view, I accept I'm quite opinionated sometimes, is that if we wipe out those statues and forget them from our history, then there's a greater danger of us forgetting our history. 
So I would rather see him in a museum, still painted, to mark what happened that day and with the story posted next to it for all our children's and grandchildren's education going forward. We haven't talked enough in the UK, at least, about slavery. And as far as most of Europe's concerned, that was something that happened 200 years ago that we just don't talk about at all. I'm just going to stop there because I did say I would warn you before the video came in. So what we're going to see now, we're going to see two video clips taken from Wembley Stadium. The first of these is an internal CCTV camera. Now, just to set the scene again, it's the middle of the summer. England are playing in their first final. We've just come out of lockdown. In fact, technically, we weren't out of lockdown. This was one of our government test events. We're playing against an old rival. We have a good chance of winning. We are the favourites, certainly playing at home. We have a 94, 95,000 seater stadium, but because of COVID, they only decide to sell 65,000 tickets. Is that important? We still don't know. But it does mean that a lot of people, we think, thought, if I can get into the stadium, once I'm in, there's 30,000 spare seats where I can hide. So it could be quite easy to hide once I'm inside. If you normally went to a stadium, which was a sellout, as it would be for this game, once you're inside, you're not going to be able to hide anyway because you can't keep wandering around trying to find a seat when there's no seats available. You would immediately be asked for your ticket. You wouldn't have a ticket and you would be ejected. So during the course of that day, alcohol, drugs and general misdemeanor and misbehavior accelerated and was unchallenged for hours and hours on end. The game didn't kick off until 8 o'clock on a Sunday night. People had been outside that venue since 8 o'clock in the morning. But the policing operation didn't start until three o'clock in the afternoon, so there was no tone set in. So the crowd behaviour degenerated, degenerated. Nobody challenged it. It continued to get worse and mixed in with drug, alcohol, being in a crowd for the first time and being inexperienced at being in crowds and how to celebrate, things quickly got out of hand. The two videos I'm going to show you show what happens on one gate. Now, bearing in mind, this is one gate. At the same time as this is happening, and over a period of several hours, three, four, five hours, attack after attack after attack, probably a couple of hundred attacks altogether, we think, but we lost count. But at the time you're watching this one, 17 or 18 other gates are being attacked at the same time. So this is what happened. I'm going to draw your attention initially to the gate, which is closed. It's been forced once, and it's been pushed closed by... The staff. This is an emergency exit, a fire exit, that should remain closed with magnetic locks on at 25%, so they can be popped easily if there's a fire alarm. But the safety manager is so concerned about all these gates getting stormed that he's actually upped the magnetic um, holding to 50%, and later they went to 100%. I'll draw your attention to a lady in a black knee-length dress with blonde hair in the middle of the shot calling other people towards her. She is a senior manager at Wembley who was trying to keep these mindless hooligans out when it all went horribly wrong. Please remember what I said. If you don't like seeing people hurt, look away. I will tell you when you can look back because there's two videos back to back. One is a handheld from a phone and the, set of the first one is actually from inside on the CCTV itself. I'm going to start that video now. So you can see the lady in the black dress. She's getting people to come towards her. There's a lot of security over to the right-hand side. They're still doing their job. They still have people coming in. The longer you leave the gates locked, the longer the pressure's going to last. You can see at the top of those two gates that they're holding, it's buckled already, and it's rocking slightly. That's not them. That's people outside trying to pull it open. There's obviously a sense of those inside that something's going to happen. Uh, you can see a guy with the blue denim jacket and his friend in the black jacket video in there. They clearly think something's about to happen. The other security and stewards are on standby. Uh, but now the gate starts to go. And the left-hand gate is forced open first. And these are outward opening gates, which obviously makes things very difficult if you're inside trying to hold them closed. They just about get it back, and then suddenly the crowd overwhelmed them. If you watch that lady in the black dress, you will see very shortly she's going to get knocked backwards and bangs her head very hard on the floor. The head injury she suffered was very minor, but what comes next is some of the worst violence I've seen and the lack of 
empathy with other people. If you look towards the right-hand side of the white pillar, you'll see a child in a man's arms and two other children with him. He has just managed to pull his children free from the crowd. There's actually another one in there that is just drugging out along with his wife. If you look at the pile now, it's about two and a half to three deep. We know if you're at the bottom of that pile of bodies, you have approximately two minutes to two minutes 15, depending on your size, weight, strength, physical fitness, alcohol consumption, etc. around about two to two and a half minutes before you're unconscious. And a minute or so later, you will be suffering brain damage and then death. Those people have now been on the floor for about a minute to a minute and a quarter. A lot going on. The lady that we saw earlier is now up and away. She's towards the center of the top of the picture, talking to the man by the white pillar. She's okay. She's shaken. She's not badly injured. She was dragged out by a steward. Bit by bit now, there are still people climbing over the top of other people on the floor. And you'll see that even more so in the other video. And the police have just arrived outside. Batons drawn in some cases and started to force that crowd back. But in the meantime, hundreds have managed to get in. And you can see the debris and some angry stewards. Um, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say some people lost control that day. They were extremely angry about seeing their friends injured, seeing their friends um, walk away bleeding, and some people lost their cool and did things they shouldn't have done. And I'm neither going to forgive nor condone what went on that day. It's not right, but I think it's quite understandable when adrenaline's flowing and you're seeing your friends being hurt. Even though the police held that gate, you can see there is a second attack going on. I think this second video, which I've had to turn the audio off because I haven't got a beep machine sufficiently strong to cover all the swear words. So please, if you're still looking away, continue to look away. We will now see what happens from the ground floor, as it were, from a handheld camera, the same position. You can just about see the legs of the lady that we were talking about earlier as that gate comes forced in. She's on the floor now. The initial response of the cameraman is to run away and hide behind the pillar himself but then he realized the surge isn't going to be quite as big and this is one of the problems when you get surges through gateways like this as the pressure that's been against those people at the front comes off and the gates pop open they actually have so much pressure behind them they fall on the floor and the ones behind them fall on top of them the third and fourth wave quite often fall on top of them there's the man managing to escape with his children but you get a better view a better angle now uh, if the photographer takes his camera out of the way you can now see from this angle that there are people trapped the the young kid in the white hoodie uh, no ticket and shouldn't have been there but that doesn't mean he should be in a position where he's now getting crushed by other people on top of him you can see the first of the police arrivals have just arrived outside and that is the saving grace that is the only thing that stops people dying that day and yes that's wrong and i will not condone that person kicking out at someone but fear and adrenaline is a massive driver into behaving in a way that you might not do on a normal day at the office you can see the number of people that are having to be helped those people haven't been breathing some of them for the last 30 seconds to a minute they are really in quite a serious physical and mental uh, medical condition i did say at the start of it no one died thank goodness no one died the official report that we did into Wembley, which is online and available, or I'm happy to share anybody, talks extensively about the behaviours and the unpredicted and unpredictable behaviours. Even though we knew it was going to be different, we had no idea it was going to be at this level. We had no expectation that this level of violence would be shown and this level of disregard for the, the lives and safety of other human beings. That report has called upon our government now to pass a new piece of legislation whereby if you are so reckless in what you do that you endanger and threaten other people's lives not in the workplace because that's already on the statute books here but if you are just reckless in your behavior around other people that it leads or likely leads to the death of another person then there would be a piece of legislation under which you could be charged and dealt with by the courts for those still looking away you can now no you can't you can now look back because we've finished those videos and I won't be showing those again. 6th of January, 2021, we saw the invasion, for want of a better phrase, of the Capitol building. And I have seen some behaviors and some pressure through doorways and people 
being knocked over and other people falling on top and others trampling over the top of them in those videos that are identical to what I saw at Wembley. The motivation is different, the driver is different, but it's about an extreme level of passion for something that you believe in and potentially combined with a freedom from lockdown where people haven't been able to um, do what they might normally do, that pressure valve release that's come in place. So I compare the two because of the behaviours, nothing to do with the reasons or the motivation behind it, just what you see on the videos looks very, very similar. And certainly in terms of some of the more exuberant behaviours at the Travis Scott concert, again, I repeat, no one is blaming the crowd here. Just as I am not going to stand back and blame Live Nation or Travis Scott or anybody else yet, because it's still too early and we're still gathering evidence. You know, I'm seeing people saying it was the barriers that were the problem. Okay. When I study all the barriers and all the locations and all the crowds and all the crowd densities, I might come to the same conclusion. But it's far too early as yet to say that the barriers were the problem or the crowd plan was the problem or Travis Scott was the problem or Live Nation were the problem. We'll judge that in due course when we can. What we're trying to do at the moment is take whatever lessons are available to us to make sure it doesn't happen again. And that has to be P1 in terms of priorities. That has to be stop this from happening again. Lots of other things have happened. Our kids particularly have lost some of their rights of passage. Not just our kids, adults as well. But the youngsters have lost their graduations of commencements or convocations. They haven't been able to do that in the same way. My children haven't been able to take driving lessons. My nephews, my nieces were banned from going out and driving lessons or take their driving tests. It is an expectation when you reach a certain age that you're going to be able to drive a car and have that freedom that you don't have to rely on mom and dad driving you around everywhere anymore. And we have a generation or a two-year gap of people that have lost that and are now struggling to catch up, couldn't drive right at the outbreak, and then are now doing their, te doing their exams but still cannot get a test booked because booking tests now is a ridiculous process over here. It's taken eight or nine months to get a driving Birthdays, significant birthdays haven't been able to be celebrated properly. Weddings I've already referenced. And funerals. I've lost friends, not through COVID. Uh, I have lost some friends through COVID, but I've lost close friends for other reasons in the last two years. And I've either had to watch their funerals online or not go at all. And that is a significant part of us saying goodbye to our friends and family. And Don, my apologies, because I know this is raking up some pretty horrible stuff but not being able to say goodbye properly to the people that we would want to has changed us as people the press if there are any press or media on this call today can i apologize because i'm assuming that you're nice people but not all are some of the media hype and hype overlay has been ludicrous using phrases front page headlines childhood stolen therefore driving a rift between those younger people and those older people who feel that they've had part of their life stolen. We've all had a bit of it stolen or made different. Let's stop facing one group off against another. Headlines that say university students are broken and defeated. They're bent and they are damaged. They're not broken and they're not defeated. Not the vast majority anyway. They will bounce back. We are human beings and we are generally resilient. We will get over this as long as we try to get over it together and don't divide ourselves into groups that have suffered more than others. The elderly were left to die alone and unloved. Well, there's places where that happened. But a front page headline blaming people for an unprecedented world situation isn't going to help anybody. And my favorite, my favorite of all, just a couple of weeks ago in one of our papers, students seek counselling after COVID robbed them of their chance to lose their virginity. It's going to happen at some stage, fingers crossed. We don't need a front page headline making people feel even worse about what happened during COVID. I really think our media are helping any of our positions or our mental health at all at the moment. And as for social media, I despair. That particular rabbit is out of the hole and will never, ever be put back in and i think we are all worse for it because there are more nasty people saying nasty things on social media it seems than there are nice people on some social media at least i am not on twitter and judging by other people's experience i won't be going on there 
we've got to look at both sides of the same story because it is the same story. And if you are the 18 year old, you'll say you've had the best years of your life stolen, your education ruined, and your social life's been destroyed. You've missed out on essential rituals. You're still not allowed to drive and you've lost your friends. Your life's been on hold. Your mental health's affected. Uh, and for everybody working from home, I would say our mental health have been affected. But I do think genuinely with younger people, and I think of my neighbors and their daughter who started a job and a week later was told she was going to be working from home. She never got to integrate or mix or socialize. She left school and sat in a bedroom working for a year and a half. That cannot not affect you. And I think certainly in her case, it has. But from the other perspective, the now 62 year old's point of view, my wife's looking at me from the other side of the room and reminding me I'm nearly 63, but we'll say 62 for now. My point of view, I've lost two years of my family life, two years of my kids and my grandkids, two years of holidays, missed the funerals for the ones that I loved. And I've got money building up in the bank that I haven't been able to spend. Those two years of holidays are holidays that I can now afford that I could never have afforded before. I'm later in life and I can afford holidays that I couldn't afford in my 20s and 30s. But I've just lost two years of being able to go on them. I'll probably run out of years before I run out of holidays and places that I want to go. I've had two of those stolen away from me. 10% of my remaining years, 10% of holidays that I can never go back on, the ones that I can really afford and have a great time. And if you sit and look at that and say, oh, those poor people, because each of those has lost more than the other, then that's the rabbit hole we go down that will stop us coming out of this. We've got to look at it from a different angle. We've got to look at it and put ourselves in the shoes of the 18-year-old go, I don't necessarily agree with you, but I understand what you're saying. Let me compare stories. I'm not whining. I'm not moaning. I'm not groaning. But let's just compare stories. If you think you've had your best life uh, years of your life stolen, I've lost 10% of mine. And I empathize and I sympathize with you, but we've both got a story to tell. The solution is to understand each other better. We've got to talk and we've got to be more kind. Somebody put that in the um, in the chat a little earlier. We have to be more kind. We were brilliant for two or three months. We were amazing. And then we lost the plot and we started hating on each other more than we've ever hated on each other before. And that we've got to unpick. In practical terms, for events particularly, we are influenced by people around us who are similar to us. If you want to influence people at your events, seek those who are similar to the people that are going. Look for people who are good within minority groups, particularly who are the influencers and the persuaders and empower them into positions where they can bring other people on board as to where we are. I will always try and get my security and stewarding team to look as much as possible like my crowd. If I've got an EDM crowd, I want young stewards of uh, security who understand the mindset of a 25, 26 year old and why it is they would do drugs. I need that. If I've got an older 50, 60, 70 year old English heritage crowd, I'm looking for an older demographic of stewards and security. And I always did that. But now I need to do it even more. But I've got to get people who look and sound and feel like my audience to have any chance of getting them to listen to what the audience is going to say. We've got to use every means of communication to tell people why we're doing what we're doing and why that was always the case but it's even more so now people rocking up at events are arguing all the time about why we're doing stuff and if we'd been able to tell them the day before the week before the month before or even on their pathway to the gate why we were doing stuff there'd be less arguments less conflict less confrontation and i like to think less of our staff and stewards being assaulted which is a real problem over here at the moment We've got to do as much as we can to encourage good behaviors. We've government particularly have been bad at shouting at naughty people and fining them for, for doing bad stuff during COVID. Whereas actually the best way to get people to comply is to be seen to encourage those that are doing it the right way rather than punishing the bad. More carrots, less sticks. And use demographically appropriate staff. That's a politically correct phrase, isn't it? But it means what it says on the tin. People like me listen more to people like me. That doesn't make me a bad person. It doesn't mean I'm going to ignore someone who's not like me. But we are hardwired inside to listen more closely to people that have similarities with us. 
people that we can build these in groups with and understand that there are things that we've got in common with each other. In practical terms, we have to break down those in-groups and out-groups. We are now in a really dangerous position. Let's forget Ukraine and Russia. That's a pretty dangerous position, particularly from where I'm sitting. It's a little bit further away from some of you. They're coming this way, not towards you. But in-groups and out-groups are really important in terms of communication. If you don't know what they are, come and join us in early May, and we'll explain those in more detail. But we need to build relationships quick, speedy, fast bonding relationships with crowds at, at events who understand us because we're being helpful and supportive, not being difficult, aggressive, or refusing to answer their questions. We've got to wake up and sharpen up to what's going on. Our situational awareness to the world and the people around us needs to become more acute really quickly. We need to understand why people are angry and upset and understand really quickly why they un understand why they're angry and upset and then think about what we can do about it. We're going to be making more and harder decisions than we've ever had to make before at a time when we're rusty and out of practice. Avoid decision fatigue. The simple decisions that you could make the day before, make and write down so you're not making them on the day. Get as much stuff unpacked the day before the gig as you can and make sure you're not having to make tough calls on the day except those that are absolutely essential there and then. Please try to understand everybody's perspective. It's going to be interesting when we get to the Q&A and see whether people want to argue with me. I'd be really happy if you do, and I won't argue back. I'll just put my side of the story while you put your side, and hopefully we can listen to each other, we can have a virtual handshake, and then next year we can have a hug when we're over there in real life. Let's try to find that common ground. Let's try to find the things that we have in common with each other rather than the things that separate us because we are stronger if we can agree just on one little thing that is the starting point the hook on which we can continue the conversations think of the things and try to find the things that unite us make the effort go and ask that person what they're interested in go and have that conversation if it's someone that you disagree with i do not unfriend friends on facebook just because they say something that i disagree with I will go back to them and we'll have a discussion and say, I don't agree with you, but I get where you're coming from. Unfriending people that we don't like because they've said something that we're upset about is not the way to fix our problems. Challenge them by all means, have that discussion and try and find the bits that you agree with rather than the bits that you disagree with. How long is it going to go on? I don't know. And the worrying thing is neither do the psychologists. They talk about, uh, in terms of disaster fatigue, people coming together through disaster for around about two months or as long as the disaster continues. If the disaster finishes sooner, then so will that solidarity period. But it hasn't. It's gone on for two years. So for two to three months, we had a solidarity period. It was a little bit longer, they think, this time because it was a worldwide problem. So what they normally talk about in the two-month solidarity period was longer in many cases, but it's over. The honeymoon period in terms of everybody hugging and being friends with everybody has gone. Decline always follows. A decline in behavior, decline in relationships, tensions, arguments always follows that period of solidarity where decision fatigue or disaster fatigue kicks in a period of less pleasant times. Now, the difficult part here is we don't know how long this is going to be. The psychologists are telling us possibly two to three years as a guess, but they've been guessing everything else as well. This is unprecedented in our knowledge of human beings. This is unprecedented in terms of a world in which we live where everybody knows what's happening in every other country in the world, and we're going through this together, but in totally different ways. One of the psychologists I spoke to, John Drury, uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in Brighton, says that it's going to be a little bit like a half-life so if the half-life is six months then in six months time it'll be as half as bad as it is now six months later it'll be as half as bad as that again so it'll be a gradual decline and then we'll reach the new normal and the new normal might be the same as the old normal but although that's unlikely there will be a new normal that's a little bit different but we don't know what that's going to look like We've got problems over here still. We still have massive division in terms of political views. We 
have long-term fallout over some of our senior government officials who didn't comply with the rules, didn't think they applied to them, and many of you will have followed this story called Partygate. Downing Street seems to have continued to have parties whilst telling us we all stayed at home and we couldn't go out of our houses. What are the divisions in your country? What are the divisions in your organisation? What are the divisions in your town or city or communities? Look for what those div divisions are and then ignore them temporarily while you try to find the things that actually will unite you rather than divide you. But don't expect anything like normality in the next coming months. It is years in the process and probably two to three years is the best guess. And it is a guess of our psychologists. I'm going to leave my contact details up there for a few minutes. But what I have done on the slides when you get them, which you will, minus um, one of the videos, which I have to keep back because I don't own it. I've got permission to show it, but not permission to share it. So you'll get one of the videos blanked out, the other one's usable. My contact details will come back up at the end, but what I have done is for those who are interested in following this up, on the slides there will be two pages. There's the first and here's the second. Well, I'll just go back to the first temporarily. And there are scientific research projects that have been undertaken by, sometimes by the media, but they normally quote in proper academic sources, the World Health Organization, and some really eminent crowd behavioral psychologists talking. And most of the titles are self-explanatory. Some aren't, but Pandemic Fatigue, Reinvigorating the Public to Prevent COVID-19 was about we got it right to start off with, but how do we keep it going? And actually, that was a really well-timed article by the World Health Organization, which identified the fact that we probably couldn't. And it informed lots and lots of governments that if you try to maintain this level of lockdown, you will fail catastrophically. Hence the reason why all of our governments have been trying to ease off bit by bit by bit to give us some of those freedoms back. Now, some of the headlines are pretty controversial. It's just like the English Civil War was won. COVID crisis inflames neighbour disputes. And that was towards the end of the summer when that two-month, three-month honeymoon period was coming to an end. And we suddenly saw neighbour turning on neighbour because they had one extra person around for a drink in an evening and people were dialing 999 or 911 to call the police to deal with this party that was out of hand next door. That's how quickly and how horribly this thing turned so a whole string of academic research because i know you're clever people and want to going to want to follow this up and quite rightly you shouldn't take my word for this it's too important that you take one person's word you need to do your research you need to look at what's out there in terms of learning and then you need to reapply that to your own lives to your work lives and certainly to your events and the people that are coming to your events because the public are just us but without our education that's all they are we come to conferences and meetings like this to try to learn more about what has gone on and how to look after people better. The public don't do that. They haven't done that and they won't do that. It's our job and our responsibility to try to make things better for us and for them. And on that point, Don, if you're listening in the background, I'm just going to put my slide up there. I can see Don activating himself. Um, I'll leave my screen up there just for a second so people can take a screenshot copy the details if they want but hey they're all going to be back on the um they're all going to be on the powerpoint anyway so yeah i'm going to shut that down so i can see you all more properly and i can see my good friend don how are you hey, sir i i'm i'm good i've been watching the chat there's some really interesting conversations going on inside the chat itself um uh i i haven't seen i don't see any questions in the q a at the moment uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to bring up that's, that's tied to that chat is as somebody mentioned that recently, and actually since we talked last, you asked the question about whether or not some of those in incidents were happening here in BC, that, that expanded, that, that aggression. Um, yeah. Gassy Jack was torn down in Vancouver. And uh, I, I won't go into the debate about whether or not they should be torn down or not, but Eric's question to a bunch of us a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago was, are you seeing this behavior in your region? And at the time I was like, well, we haven't seen a lot of it. And whammo, there's an example of, and I'm not saying right or wrong, I'm not going to wait to that, but it is unusual behavior here. That doesn't happen a lot uh, on 
in, in BC uh, and Western Canada from my, from my experience. So I, I can say that, yes, we are seeing a bit of that. And Eric, I don't know if you heard, there was also an attack on a gas site here in BC uh, last week where there was a, a violent uh, incursion of people uh, trying to shut down um, a work site, which was really quite stunning. Um, so I can now say I have a couple of events in the media that are starting to play into that um, uh, that trend that we're seeing in other parts of the world uh, around that uh, more aggressive, uh, less compassionate behavior uh, at, at events or in, in different locations. So I thought I would share that because it does tie into the question about that statue being torn down. The question about what to do with it or what it represents is a little bit different. I'm happy to tackle that in a different session, actually, but I don't I don't want to dig into that too much here because we want to talk a little bit more about the general application to crowd management, um, as it were. Cool. I'd be really grateful if you could send me those links over, Don, as well. Um, I know you're going to be busy for the next couple of days, but Sunday's fine. <laughs> somebody will probably drop it in the chat here momentarily they might well do yeah and any yeah. anybody who's got the links for those i'd appreciate that because this is this is kind of the start of a conversation that the start of the conversation was 18 months ago when we looked at each other and went are things going to be different when we can put events back on and we all looked at each other in terms of crowd management and said yeah but we don't know what that looks like now we're starting to see what it looks like, but we're only just starting to see what it looks like. And I think we've got a lot more to come. You know, my, one of my challenges whenever I come to, to Canada is I've got a, a map of the world of all the big crowd disasters that have ever happened where people have been crushed. And there's a big hole called Canada because you've never had that big mass fatality crush situation. And I always joke, semi-joke, that the reason why that's not happened is because you're all too nice. You're all too nice to be killing each other. You know, I, I walk in a, a bar in the UK and knock into someone, spill the beer. I've got to really scramble quickly to buy that guy a beer. Otherwise, I'm going to get punched in the face. If I did that in Canada, nine times out of ten, the person whose beer I spilled would buy me one. You're just so nice over there. You're too nice to kill each other in a crowd crush. But, but if things have changed and people aren't quite so kind and nice anymore... Yeah. Does that mean I, somewhere around the corner is your crowd crush? I don't know. I hope not. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Although I will say it's one of the things that certainly keeps me up at night, worrying about because it hasn't happened and where it could. And the more I've learned from Eric and other people, the more I watch for it, look for it, and pay attention to it. And I've seen lots of potential situations where it could have easily happened. Um, and for all of you that are here, uh, it, I want you to think about some of the stuff that Eric's talked about. If you take his course, start looking at the public areas where you host events. Take a look at them from that lens and start going, wait, whoa. Um, there was a great picture a friend of ours sent us of this staircase in Toronto uh, where they do a lot of big public events. And there was this one weird staircase in the corner of the lot. And having taken the courses, they went back and looked at that staircase and went, oh, my. This is a potential place where this kind of thing can play out very easily. So there's a, a lot of what Eric does is just open your mind to a whole bunch of different possibilities So, and, and the different impacts. Um, was there anything else you saw in the chat, Eric, that you wanted to address? I'm just scrolling back now slowly uh, as you talk. Stephanie, do you have any resources, suggestions for <laughs> infrastructure or staffing for crowd control to mitigate? Um, Wow, that's a huge question. Um, I mean, the, the Wembley review took four months and the implementation of the recommendations are going to take about two years, stage by stage. So so to try and give a bit of advice, there's always the danger of giving advice that I might say one thing that someone latches onto and think that's the cure. Or, um, no, I'd have no simple solutions, but most definitely sit down and... I, that question what could possibly go wrong is the question i always ask myself and that is an open question to me what could possibly go wrong at this event okay so what could possibly go wrong is and what could possibly go wrong is and i just i don't even try and solve them i just make a list of all the things that might go wrong and then start thinking well how can i mitigate that what could i do um stephanie if, if the question's posed with something specific in mind i'm more than happy to take an email on that at, at some stage if you want to go into a specific problem. If I can give you some answers, I certainly will do. Uh, or if you're around for that course in, in a, a week or so's time, we'll, we'll cover a lot of stuff on there. 
that you can do both in terms of staffing, staff behaviors, and equipment that you might use. The one thing I would say at the moment, straight off the back of Astro World, you can buy more tech kits now to prevent people dying in crowds than you ever could before. None of it's tried, none of it's tested, lots of it's theoretical. It's all very expensive, but because it's a hot topic, there are lots of things that you can go and buy now that you couldn't buy six months ago. Please, I would guard against that. If if it's suddenly been created in the last six months because somebody thinks it's in the headlines, there's a pretty good chance there was a reason why we didn't have it before, and that's because it didn't work, and it may well have been tested. We, we're seeing some stuff now that says we can put pressure pads on barriers to test what the crowd pressure is against the barrier. The crowd didn't die against the barrier, so how is that going to help? The crowd died in the middle of the crowd. Hardly anybody died against the barrier, so a pressure pad against the barrier is not necessarily going to help me. And if the pressure is so great on a barrier, then the barrier starts to slide. So the pressure pad's not going to detect the pressure as the barrier is sliding anyway. So one example of something not to go and buy until we can get all the proper tests done. A lot, a lot of uh, snake oil salesmen out there at the moment on the back of what happened at Astro World. So just please be careful. Yes, that was also a thing we encountered with the COVIDs. <laughs> there were a oh, few. Yes. There were a few uh charlatans running around with things that were like oh wait um and and for those of you watching there were a few of us that would contact each other and go hey this thing uh so if you have questions about stuff that you're seeing out there that or that you're uh interested in uh drop drop me a line uh i i might be able to help with uh, that or i can bounce it off eric or one of the many other people that we have working in this in this realm um definitely could be uh we've only got a couple of minutes left anything else you wanted to address yeah uh, there's a couple just gone into the q a um thinking about broader connection to global news how do you think impacts copycat behavior statues toppling etc they do um for anybody that's that studied the first follower principles it's pretty clear that most movements need a leader and once you've got a leader you need a group of people to start to follow it and we use it in evacuation. I never, ever try to evacuate a whole crowd because I don't need to. If I can get a group of people moving towards exits, most people will then follow because there is somebody else already doing it. And there are huge chunks of our community, our society, that follow people for right reasons and follow people for wrong reasons, but they follow people. So if they see that demonstrated nationally and internationally now all over the news and, and social media, it's more likely to trigger similar behaviors in others. And the second one was thinking about broader connections to global news. How do you think it impacts? No, no. Uh, it, it oh, there. <laughs> I was, was going to say that sounds very familiar. <laughs> any, advice, any advice on how to make the health and safety staff to be seen more <laughs> of something that is protecting the crowd instead of policing? Yeah, yeah. Step one, the people that are there waiting as your crowd arrive, need to be happy smiley faces giving help support and information if the first contact the public has with your staff is the security guard with sunglasses done <laughs> apart from tinting your glasses done you've done the pose thank you if it's don standing there to greet me and i see that i go negative straight away because someone's trying to control me and someone's going to tell me that they've got, I've got to hand my ticket over and empty out my pockets and my attitude becomes negative if smiley face don Who's standing there saying, hey, welcome to the show. I hope you have a great time. Can I help you with anything? If that is my first point of contact, my mood up straight away. So if there's a tip, this is where volunteers at events can come in really useful. We can't make them do things like searching and control drunks. But if they're a little further out as the point of welcome, they break down the social barriers. They become part of the in crowd and they start to help the crowd be more positive about them and about the event. That is probably the quick tip that I would give there. All right. Uh, I'm going to, Susan's last question. I will tackle that in my next session if she can make that one, because we're running out of time. We're down to one minute here. Um, I just wanted to, again, thank everybody for the really good chat. Lots of conversation. There's a couple of points in there that I'm going to follow up with individually afterwards, and I'm going to connect a couple of you with Eric with those specific questions, because there's some sure. Good, good stuff in there. And absolutely, you need to take Eric's course. If you're asking these questions, come and take it. It will do a ton of good for you. The uh, the other thing I just quickly wanted to mention was the sponsors for this session. 
uh, or IATSA 118 and Levitt Machinery, who you are, are on our machine training. Um, and thank you for them uh, helping us bring Eric here, because uh, once again, uh, Eric, thank you for taking a great deal of time out of your evening to join us. Uh, please say hi to Don for all of us, uh, and uh, we will see you soon. Um, uh, thank you again for everything that you do. Uh, and please feel free to join me next session, because you might be able to uh, shed a bit of light on some of the questions once I get through my little presentation, if you're I'm, interested. I'm going to go and grab a quick bit of tea, or dinner, as they call it, and then I'm going to try and jump back on. Love it. Thanks so much, Eric. Great to see you. Thanks, everybody, and hope to see you in a few weeks' time. And uh, just a reminder, everybody, uh, back into the uh, you'll go back into the um, uh, into the lobby, and uh, it's uh, that break will be sponsored by our lovely friends at Stage Fab. So go do see their table. Uh, they would love to see you, and we will see you all momentarily. <laughs>